Hey folks, I'm Alex Dowd. And I'm Katie Wright. The end of 2021 is approaching quickly, and that means the AV Club is in retrospective mode. But before we look back on the year in film we just lived through, we're looking much further back, 20 years to be exact, to one of the 21st century's greatest years for movies, period. That's right, today's episode is all about our favorite movies of 2001. We've each got a pick. Welcome to Film Club. Okay, folks, welcome again to a new episode of Film Club. Thank you so much for listening. We are fast approaching the end of the year now. Um, We've been doing this all year long Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, with a few breaks here and there, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But we, you know, we're smack dab in the middle of uh, of year end season. You know, if, if, if you work for a publication like the AV Club, if you work for any any pop culture website, I would say yeah. that, that this time of year is all about catching up on uh, the big movies of the year. and uh, Screener season. Screener season, yep. And uh, just sort of getting together y- your favorites. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're, we're obviously, we're running in a week, we're running a, uh, about a week actually, uh, maybe a week and a half, we're mm-hmm. running our favorite films of the year. So mm-hmm. we've been we've been doing that. You know, that's all coming out next week and we will discuss the best films of 2021 on the podcast next mm-hmm. week. But with a little tease, we were um, talking, you know, about what our tentative number one picks are before the show. We can't tell you on the mic yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think we both have a few different choices that we're kind of cycling between at the moment. Totally. I got to say, every time I make a list, like I sit and I pick at it and I pick at it and I pick at it and I pick at it. And then <laughs> the deadline comes and I'm like, well, that's the best it'll ever be. Yeah. Like, I never feel like it's perfect. Yeah, I mean, th- so there are some people, <laughs> there are some film critics out there who, uh, are, who who seem to have a really strong handle on their feelings to the point where they can do things like they could, they could make a ranking of every movie they saw this year and they know down to, sometimes down to like a single number what uh, how, what they prefer over over mm-hmm. th- there's a real precision to their ranking. Mm-hmm. That's never been my experience. Um, <laughs> I, I think that it's it's good to I think it's it's good to know it's good for you the listener and good for readers to know that um, I always see something like a top ten of the year as a um, as a perpetual work in progress. Yeah, you know, you, you subject see, to change. It, subject to change. You might change your mind after it posts later. You might realize that you were too hard on one movie mm-hmm. or you were. T- little bit too high on another one mm-hmm. it's, it's always going to be shifting in our heads mm-hmm. even if we're on the record you know ultimately yeah these it, things. like <laughs> the thing is is that like you know it's the same as giving grades for movies like sometimes you're on a deadline and you're like well this is what i'm thinking right now so exactly we'll exactly <laughs> none of it none of it is etched in stone for us mm-hmm. i feel like mm-hmm. you know so yeah next week if you tune in next week it's it's the last episode of the year for us the last episode of of, of, of film club in 2022 and we will be talking about the best movies of the mm-hmm. year before that, we're actually, we, as I mentioned in the opening, we're going to be going back a little bit further. We're going to be back about 20 years. Yep. And um, I'd say, actually, before we get into this, I, I just, uh, we're, get, we're going to acknowledge it's been a weird time here around the AV Club lately. It's kind of the elephant in the room. Um, not a lot more we can say about it right now, but it's, it is cast an interesting pall over, over, over everything right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah tr- so. Trust. We're, we're, we're thinking about a lot of stuff. Exactly. So um, in some respects, it's kind of nice to, uh, to look back 20 years and, and to, to just sort of go into the past a little bit, not think about the present moment mm-hmm, that you're living mm-hmm, through mm-hmm. to just think about 20 years ago where you were at what what movies you were watching <laughs> um we you know so every year at the website we uh every year at least for the last few years mm-hmm. uh we since have I've been here yeah yeah for, for uh i think at least since uh since 2017 i think is when we okay, started doing okay, this okay. but every year we will pull our regular contributors and we will make a list of the best movies of that respective year mm-hmm. the idea is if the av club was ranking movies back then if it was doing year end lists, what would it look like? Now, obviously, right. there, there's no way to um, to know what. For, for one thing, it's an entirely different staff now than it was back mm-hmm. then. And beyond that, we can't we can't all pretend that we we haven't lived through 20 years and that we haven't um, that that our our sensibilities haven't changed. So right. you can't really look at a list that we post like the best movies of 2001 and say that's what it would have looked like in 2001. Right. Well, that's what I was going to say. You know, we were talking about like best films of the year that you're living in at that moment can be kind of a living document. But for me, looking back at you know like best films of 2000. 2001, I feel like I can be a little more final in my choices Mm -hmm. because like things like how, you know, like a film's legacy and, you know, just its staying power and stuff like that has been tested. 
yeah. by the time you're looking uh, back 20 years in the past. And so, you know, making a list like this, I feel more confident being like, no, this is the ma- major work of this year, you know, just because of the time that's passed. No, I mean, you're, you're actually making a case that like maybe we should actually wait 20 years before we do this <laughs> ever, you know, that like well, 20 years is a good amount of time to wait to actually have a sense of what the best movies of the year yeah. m- might have been, you know? Well, she, you're saying we should be historians instead of journalists. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um, for those who are curious, we, we did post that last week on the website. You can go to avclub.com mm-hmm. and you can see the best movies of 2001. About a dozen contributors pitched in on that. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's pretty a pretty damn good list, if I don't say so myself. Yeah, you want to run down the top 10? Oh, sure. I can do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, give me a second here and I will take a look at it. Uh, yeah. OK, so our top 10 a- as chosen by, again, about about a about a dozen people. Mm-hmm. Um, With pretty uh, varying tastes, I think. That's one nice thing about the pool of film contributors we have. For sure. It's gotten to a point where I think we're, 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 getting, we're getting some high, we're getting some low, we're mm-hmm. getting, you know, pe- people have, we all have slightly different sensibilities, so that's mm-hmm. nice. Um, okay, so our top 10 movies of 2001, as presented on the website, are number 10, Workmeister Harmonies, number 9, Gosford Park, number 8, AI, Artificial Intelligence, number 7, The Man Who Wasn't There, number 6, Audition, Number five, Memento. Number four, The Royal Tenenbaums. Number three, Ghost World. Number two, In the Mood for Love. Number one, Mulholland Drive. Now, looking at that list, the thing that really strikes me is that seven out of ten of these are studio Hollywood productions, which, like, when you compare it to, um, say, uh, our best films of 2020 list, Mm -hmm. which, you know, had a lot more indie and even experimental work on it, and, and, uh, you know, obviously uh, films that aren't in English. Uh, Burning was our first film to be number one that wasn't in English. Um, yeah, I just feel like that's partially, I mean, 2020 was a unique year, but, um, you know, just, I, I find that since I've been voting, our lists have not been this heavy on like studio Hollywood work. Mm -hmm. Although I might dispute that characterization a little bit because, um, and you know, it, it gets, it gets tricky around this time in American movie history saying what is or is not a studio movie. True. Um, because I mean, obviously none of these in, uh, I would say only one of these films in the top 10 was released by uh, a major movie studio. True. And that would be AI. True. Uh, a lot of them are, are released by mini majors. So mm. so where is the line? This in, was the era of the mini major. It was. I mean, this was still, we were still living very much in the Weinstein era. You can almost say that 2001 was sort of a, a was one of the last gasps of of uh, of Miramax mm-hmm. as as a company that oh was, yeah um, Miramax was very powerful at this ruling time. the roost at that point yeah yeah no that's um, a that's a great point like what I see as like Hollywood productions is colored by the landscape of today where yeah. like these mini majors aren't they're just not a thing so much anymore it, certainly they have much less influence mm-hmm. it's shifted a lot mm-hmm. um yeah i mean a good number of these at least a good number of these in the top 10 are at least uh very very strongly american films yeah and you know and they and a lot of them have you know big movie stars in them and things like that totally name directors yep yeah i i, I tend to think of 2001 as uh, i know everyone loves 1999 that's the year everyone talks about mm-hmm. the great year for movies the great year for american movies mm-hmm. of the last mm-hmm. 30 years or so whatever uh, I tend to think of 2001 as the great movie year of my lifetime yeah I think yeah. yeah I mean you know the years that I've been participating in this poll you know for a couple different factors one by 2001 I was a lot more cognizant of film mm-hmm. than I was say in like 1997 mm-hmm. just because of my age um, so you know a lot of these films are, are loom really big in my memory but also yeah just like going back and rewatching them and making the list again like just even compared to like 1999 or 2000, especially 2000, 99 was a strong year, but 2000 was not a super strong year for film. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, uh, revisiting a lot of this work, I was like, man, this really holds up. This is quality work. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I wish I could actually, I wish I had put it on paper at some point what my list was in 2001 because mm. I was definitely making movie lists at that point. <laughs> um, I will say that my access was uh, in 2001 was different than it is now as, oh, a, for sure. as a film critic living in, in Chicago. 
Chicago, Illinois, <laughs> as opposed to a, a senior in high school living in Lansing, Michigan. Yeah, I got um, a lot of my movies. A lot of the best films of 2001 I ended up watching in 2002. Because well, exactly. My whole thing yeah. was, my thing at the time was I got a TV VCR combo. You remember those little square ones? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Ones. I got one of those yeah. for like my 18th birthday or something. And um, I used to go to Blockbuster and, you know, buy the by the um, VHS tapes from yeah, the bargain yeah, yeah, bin yeah. of Blockbuster. And that's how I saw it. I have a VHSs of a lot of these movies at home, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were definitely <laughs> there's definitely movies on this list, for example, that I did not see until 2002. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure Mulholland Drive and the Coen Brothers film, The Man Who Wasn't There, did not make it to uh, my hometown until, until 2002. Well, you know, I mean, Audition... Like, oh, yeah, I didn't see that with... until years later. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, I will, another thing to note about this particular list and something that seems to be a real hang up for some people in the comments, maybe people who can't read the intro or don't feel inclined <laughs> to read the intro, which lays it You're out very today. clearly. <laughs> yeah, well, just fucking read the intro before you tell us we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> but that would Dipshits. mean they have to, con that would mean that they can't feel smarter than us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, one one of the rules that that we apply for this is we try to, uh, in our desire to make this kind of line up with the way that we do normal year end lists, the way that we're, we're going to do, for example, the the best list, the, the the list of the best films of twenty twenty one, is that we only consider films that were released in the United States in that particular year. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you end up getting films on the list every year when we do this that were you know that that premiered in uh, a, the previous year or maybe two years earlier. Mm -hmm. um, in this case. I mean, the, the the one that stands out the most probably is in the mood for love that premiered mm -hmm. at Cannes in, in in the previous year in yep. 2000. Didn't make it to American theaters till 2001. Yep. So what you have is, you, I mean, we had people last year being like, "Where's in the mood for love?" And it was like, just wait till next year. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I remember because, like I was saying, 2000 wasn't as strong of a year as 2001. I remember you know making the 2000 list and being like, "Man, I wish I could put it." Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, and you know, if if we end up doing this next next year. I mean, I, I feel like Spirited Away will probably be on that list. Mm. So if you're looking at this list right now, if you're listening to this and you're looking at this list and saying, where's Spirited Away? Well, wait till next year. <laughs> 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 um, let me ask you this. Uh, do you remember what your favorite movie of 2001 was in 2001? Yes, because I wrote a whole essay about it last week. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Ghost World. Ghost yeah, World. Okay. I identified very strongly with Ghost World at the time. <laughs> See, I actually, I rewatched that too during during the process of, mm. of making this list. I, I fucking loved it. I, I probably loved it even more than I mm -hmm. loved it then. And um, I disturbingly identified with, with Seymour. That's totally okay. <laughs> you know what? I've gotten a couple of different emails about that essay because, you know, it got a little more personal than sure. usual. Um, and a couple different people are like, as a man, I always felt, you know, more Seymour. Like, I hope that's okay. And I was like, that's absolutely okay. <laughs> like, it is absolutely fine. Well, the thing is, Enid is kind of on a path to become Seymour eventually, right? Oh, yeah. No, that's a big part of why they connect. Right. Yeah. yeah. She, that, that is who she will become if she's not, you know. It, it's kind of who she wants out. to become. I think so. Yeah, yeah, she wants to be a Seymour, really. Yeah. You know, because he does. He he's not part of the dreaded uh, mainstream. Right. You right. Know? But the movie is very clear about how lonely it can be to set yourself apart in the way that they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Great fucking movie, by the way. Like yeah. ag again, not one of the movies we're going to be talking about today because we all have films we like more. But I think it says something that we can we can we can look at Ghost World and say no, that was not the great movie of the year because mm -hmm. it's a great fucking movie it is and released in another year it would it would probably be my favorite what's you know? funny is that you know um going back and revisiting it i was like this is actually a great movie because you know like when i thought back on it before watching it again when i hadn't seen it in almost 20 years i i kind of thought of like oh yeah that was just a movie i was into when i was a teenager you know i didn't think mm -hmm. it was a great film per se until i went back and watched it again which is one kind of one of the fun things about getting into this territory that we're in where you know it's stuff that's within our movie watching lifetimes totally mm -hmm. what's one that you have uh, cooled on over the years through this mm. process good question oh Hedwig and the Angry Inch probably oh really yeah. okay yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of one that I rewatched that I was like uh, yeah I don't like that as much and anymore and Peros I didn't love mm -hmm. as much watching it again yeah. how much of that though is um, is some sort of phantom knowledge of where Inaritu's career would go from <laughs> Morris Peros yeah. so I do think it, it well, might be his best film it. yeah it's part of it <laughs> um, okay 
I I gave mine. What's what was your favorite of these movies in two thousand one? Oh, Memento. Memento? Yeah. No question. I mean, Memento is very much it. That's mean, another one I had to begrudgingly acknowledge was very good, what we did oh. for the Nolan series, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, so last year, if, if regular listeners remember, we we, we did a, a regular series on the films of Christopher Nolan. We went back and watched all of Nolan's films and talked about them on the show. You can you can find that in the archives, the, the film club archives. Yeah, Memento holds up. Mm-hmm. It really does. <laughs> Still a great movie, I think. It really does. Um, but, I mean, obviously at the time, it also very much spoke to um, 17 year old me who was very into um, movies with twists and, yeah. and complicated structures. Uh-huh. Playing with time was always something that was very exciting to me. Do, as you, a, do you remember wh- where you saw it? I remember the night I saw it even. Yeah. Uh, it was after a track meet. Okay. Actually, yeah, it, was out of, it was a Saturday. I was out of town. I was at a track meet and I, we came back into town. We got back pretty late because it was out of, but there was a, there, I was able to just make like the 940 or 50 show or something at okay. the movie theater I worked at, the big multiplex. And um, I was exhausted from the from the meet, and uh, Memento woke me up. Oh, I love that. Um, yeah. I remember I watched it just at a friend's house. She had rented it, and we had all heard about this movie and how cool it was, and we watched it, and we were like, wow, that was really good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, and, and I do think it holds up. Memento is a fine choice, I think, for the, for the best of the year. I think that you could look at almost anything – at least in this top 10 mm-hmm. and say that all of these would make. Oh yeah, you can make an argument for any of these. Right, obviously. they would all make good choices for the yeah. best movie of the year, I think. But these are not our individual choices for the mm. best movie of the year. Mm-hmm. So we're going to talk about those today and uh, I, I, let's start with yours, Katie. Okay. Uh, and let's talk about um, well, Mulholland Drive. Mulholland Drive, that yeah. was my choice for number one and it was the number one movie and I felt vindicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, M- Mulholland Drive over the years has... Um, has really risen in in the. Uh, I mean, it was it was w- very well received from the start. It premiered mm-hmm. at Cannes, very well received there. Won the Best Director Prize. I believe yeah, it actually I, split it with the Coen Brothers. I think. I but. think sometimes there's this kind of misconception in retrospect that like David Lynch movies were hated mm-hmm. in the '90s and early 2000s, and they weren't. They, no, he's they always they been critically <laughs> critically acclaimed. You know, like, I mean, people did boo Fire Walk with Me at Cannes, but. People boo everything at Cannes. Yeah, that's the tradition at Cannes. You, <laughs> you gotta boo. I mean, it's mostly the yeah. French who do it, I feel like, mostly years. But um, yeah, Mulholland Drive was well received immediately. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I don't have it in front of me exactly where it fell in general critical consensus. I don't mm-hmm. I don't think the Village Voice was doing their poll yet. Um, IndieWire certainly wasn't. So, the, uh, you know, sort of looking at the, the, the landscape of film criticism, I don't know if Mulholland Drive was considered the best then. Mm-hmm. Over the years, however, it is, it is most definitely risen uh, in the ranks. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's I feel like it's now the consensus choice for best movie of 2001. Yeah. Um, in 2016, the BBC conducted a big poll of um, about 100, I think 177 film critics to determine the greatest films of the 21st century. Mm-hmm. Everything past 2000, Mulholland Drive was number one. Yep. Um, Sight and Sound did a poll in 2012 of the best movies ever made, and Mulholland Drive was already at, at 28. And wow, this, this ever is, uh, made? Yeah, this is 11 years after it was made. Wow. It's, a, it's, it's a beloved film, and uh, I think it, it's it's pretty easy to see why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is pretty easy to see why. Um, watching it again uh, recently, I was uh, struck by, you know, kind of the – there are little seeds in this movie that were things that – would come out more in Twin Peaks The Return. Oh, yeah. Like, I think this really set the template for Lynch's, you know, uh, n- not that, like, this and Lost Highway are all that different, mm-hmm. you know, but I think that this film was kind of the turning point where he uh, started really pushing towards the style that he's been doing since then. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's fascinating about Lynch is that I think that you can, you can all, I think that if you look at his movies, uh, chronologically, mm. you can see often see a progression, you yes. know, and I think that that Mulholland Drive to me falls on this continuum between Lost Highway, between mm-hmm. some of the themes he's dealing with in, in Lost mm-hmm. Highway and some of the style he's dealing with, and uh, Inland Empire, which yep. is the film he made afterwards, mm-hmm. and which is now on, his only feature. Sorry, nerds. Twin Peaks season three is not a fucking yeah, movie. Sorry, guys. It's, like it, it's 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 a television show. There's it's, no need to <laughs> condescend to television, guys. Like television can be good. Television can have this one. <laughs> they can they can have season three of Twin Peaks. Yeah, like Great I TV don't know. <laughs> this is my hot take: is that I find Twin Peaks: The Return is a movie to be kind of condescending because it's assuming that something has to be cinema if it's great. 
Well, sure. You know what I mean? I mean, and it has values that I think are cinematic, and I, I think I think what, what. But it's an episodic show. They episodic. have musical numbers at the I end know, of every episode. There, there are little there there are very specific breaks <laughs> at the end of episode. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, we we could probably do a whole episode about that. Oh, totally. Um, and piss off a lot of a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of deep cinephiles, I suppose. Um, but uh, I think what's interesting about Mulholland Drive is it, it did, you know, um, you talk about Twin Peaks as being ex- accepted as a movie. The season three talked about as a movie. Mulholland Drive began as television. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It was a pilot for a TV show that he was pitching to ABC. Um, ABC, can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> well, ABC was like, uh, pass. Um, <laughs> supposedly, it was a single executive who killed this thing. It's really funny to think that the most beloved movie of the 21st century was almost a television so- show but for a- an executive that was like are no. you saying that hollywood executives are not always the smartest people um, but they make a lot of money out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Are you saying they don't have perfect judgment and impeccable taste? It's actually it's it's, it's very funny to think that that because Mulholland Drive is a critique of Hollywood in, in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. It's funny to think that um, that the industry that he is critiquing rejected it as well. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, um, and that happens sometimes. I mean, for sure. look at the um, fate of the assistant. You know, I think that right. movie was a little too real for a lot of people in the industry. Totally, you can definitely see vestiges of of, of this being a, a pilot for a TV show. Mm-hmm. Um, there are probably there are elements of the movie that kind of go nowhere. Mm-hmm. They're, that sort of feel now like non sequiturs. Well, I don't know if you could say they go nowhere mm. because, like, if you <laughs> if you've seen the movie five or six times, like I have, <laughs> um, it all kind of comes together. You can see like um, uh, elements are repeated in different contexts, mm-hmm. and um, even lines of dialogue are repurposed later on. Sure. Like you just have to look through it through the standard Lynchian lens. Lynchian lens of dream logic, but you will grant that there are there are scenes in the movie that how do I put this? I think I, you know I like this movie a lot. Mm-hmm. I think there are scenes in the there there are elements of the movie that feel to me expendable. That feel like you could remove this from the movie and it wouldn't be doing doing that much damage like to it. Okay, so there's there there's, there's a really. Uh, I like this scene. It, it sort of feels like it belongs in a different movie, to me, honestly. The botched murder scene. Yeah, uh, that's you know? that, that's what I that's what I thought. Yeah. But that character recurs later. He does, but that to me that also sort of feels a little bit like Lynch being like, "Well, I got to I got to bring this all together." Because mm. I mean, you also really have to look at Mulholland Drive as something that was conceived in one way and then completed in a different way. Yeah. Lynch said, "Let's okay, it's not going to be a TV show. We'll make it into a feature." And I'll tie some loose ends up here. Mm. You know? Yeah, I mean, I could see that. But I could also see this film being conceived in reverse. Because, mm-hmm. like, a lot of things that do seem random in this film and don't seem to tie together do tie together at the end. Yeah. Um, since this is a 20-year-old film, I'm just going to say I'm going to oh, yeah. uh, explain the end of Mulholland Drive. <laughs> we, we should say, uh, well, I- I- explaining the end of Mulholland Drive is a contentious business in and of itself well, because there's different interpretations. Of but, course. Well, that's what's great about it, yeah. in my opinion. But <laughs> I have my own personal interpretation of it. We'll, we'll say before we move forward that uh, if you have not seen Mulholland and drive and you would and you would like to go into it cold well this this episode might not be the one for you we're going to talk probably in some detail about Mulholland Drive and also about my picks so Mm -hmm. um spoilers okay so yeah um just for a quick little bit of summary so Mulholland Drive has a like you said a couple different storylines but the two main ones involve Naomi Watts character and Laura Elena Herring's character where Naomi Watts is this like naive girl from Deep River Ontario who comes to Hollywood to become an actress and when she gets there there's this beautiful woman with amnesia staying in her aunt's apartment Mm -hmm. and everything goes great and beautiful you know and they fall in love and she knocks it dead at her audition and she you know is living the Hollywood dream then all of a sudden the movie pivots yeah and I follow the interpretation of Mulholland Drive, which says that the first half is the fantasy of the character who, you know, is uh, uh, of Naomi Watts's character. It is the fantasy of her character because the other main plot line is Justin Thoreau is a film director who uh, just basically gets his life ruined. Yeah. And we find out in the second half that that same person, Justin Thoreau's character, ruined Naomi Watts' life. Right. So it's really, to me, like when you look at it this way, everyone who has done the real life Diane Selwyn wrong gets theirs 
in her fantasy. Yeah. Like the director who didn't like her is really impressed by her. Um, you know, the the guy who stole her man gets beat up and all of it, loses all of his money. Um, the woman who rejects her is in love with her again yeah. and needs her and all this kind of stuff. And to me, you know, and that and to me that speaks to the kind of core theme of the film, which is that Hollywood is a place that promises much and de- and delivers only misery. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I think you're you're spot on, and and I think this is this is a popular interpretation of the film. And yeah, I think it is. It, I I didn't come up with this. It's the one that makes the most sense, though, mm-hmm. honestly, and, and, and also to think of it possi- possibility that what we're experiencing through much of the film is a, a kind of death dream, you know, mm-hmm. that um, that Betty is uh, that that Betty is has taken some pills and is dying, and that this is what she's imagining as she goes. Well, I think Betty yeah. is Diane. Right. Diane well, is imagining she's Betty. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, I'm I'm using the names interchangeably. Yeah, oh, but yes, right. Yeah. But because Diane, even yeah. the name Betty at the end of the movie, you see that the waitress at the diner, her name is Betty. Yeah. Every yeah. single little piece. So it, is it, there. It's interesting that people treat this like this this mystery box that that um, I think it's a very solvable puzzle. I think it's very simple. I, I will say that I've heard some I don't interesting. Know about simple, but it's solvable. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have heard some interesting alternative explanations Ooh, yeah. for it. Um, one of them that I really like, uh, a friend of mine actually. Um, I think this is his idea. He might have read it somewhere, but I think I think this is his. He thinks that the movie is basically a star is born that just removes the downfall part in between. Oh, so interesting. So that it really is, we are seeing them meet each other, and then what happens later, it literally does happen sequentially later in the plot. We just, it just jumps ahead. Wow, it just skips the whole, like... It skips the whole downfall. It's already happened. It skips happened. the becoming of star part. Yeah, it's, yeah exactly. The yeah. star part is gone, yeah. Interesting. I find that that that, that explanation fascinating. Too. Yeah, I don't yeah. I don't think it totally holds up as well as the idea that it's that it's the whole thing's a dream, really. But uh, I will have to say that, that if the whole movie is a dream... And it certainly seems that way. I think the last 15 minutes really underline that it's a dream. It, yeah. it turns into sort of similar to the ending of Lost Highway, where it just becomes like free associating imagery in a very dreamlike way. For sure. Um, and I will say that that's, that's a device that gets kind of, um, that, that gets a very bad rap. I think people thought it was all a dream, you know? Well, people, people most people don't do it as well as Lynch does. Exactly. He has a, he has a more... You know, I'm, I've read his book on transcendental meditation, and a lot of uh, what he talks about in that book, in terms of like creativity, is just sort of allowing your mind to drift and pulling out what comes. Yeah. And like, and what what he pull out what comes is naturally, since it comes from your subconscious dream logic and yeah. symbolism, and yeah, just uh, yeah, like it's 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 very resonant because he is pulling from his imagination as an American man of his generation. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Sure. Yeah, I, I actually don't think there's any filmmaker who, uh, any working filmmaker, maybe any filmmaker ever, who has gotten the feel of dream logic better than Lynch. No, I don't think so. You know? I don't think so. Um, that that kind of eerie disconnection from what you're experiencing, you know, this mm-hmm. sort of sense that you're But it in- makes sense. Yeah, Not exactly. on a logical level, but on an intuitive, emotional level, it makes sense. Yeah, it, it's funny. We did this, um, we did recently on the site, we did this whole slasher bracket thing you should check out um we ended up saying that the best slasher franchise um was a nightmare on elm street mm-hmm. and i like those movies and i and I, and I stand by that choice as the best slasher franchise i have always thought watching them though that that they don't get dream logic right no you know? not exactly they're a little bit too literal i think yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> um but, Lynch, but like let's not knock that series like in terms of imagination it knocks every oh, other slash for sure out of the park. <laughs> for sure no question i again i stand by the choice of it mm. as the best this this movie contains what i consider to be the scariest scene in a movie ever yeah um and that is the winkies diner scene because it is such a thing you would have a nightmare about that behind the dumpster at the diner by your house lives this terrifying, uh, I guess, kind of like troll hag kind of character. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you would even call it. A homeless monster, I think, is sort of. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. And, and you know, and that ties into L.A. too, you know, like they, yeah. they definitely uh, like to ignore the fact that a lot of people live on the streets there. Exactly, yeah. The, or treat the, it um, as a nuisance. You think about in, in Blue Velvet, the bugs underneath mm-hmm. the 
the bugs underneath the manicured lawn. In this, it's like the monsters hiding behind the dumpsters, yep. you know, mm -hmm. of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I think the reason that sequence works so well and the reason it, it, it gets me so much is that it gets the, the horrible inevitability of a dream. I mean, he sits there and describes exactly what he's going to experience. And then in a way that, that is so true to a nightmare, he gets up, he walks out, and is and unable happens. to stop it from happening. Mm -hmm. Yep. That is such a – I think we've all experienced that in a nightmare before mm -hmm. in one form or the other. And the way that Lynch I'm, – I'm just in awe of the way that he stretches that moment out. And it's it's interesting that it kind of, it's kind of a jump scare at the end, but it's played <laughs> so slowly. Yeah. I mean, we literally know what's coming. We, mm -hmm. we, we, we walk – we leave the diner. We walk with them. It probably takes a good minute or so at least for the whole thing to play out. Mm -hmm. For him to walk back there, it jumps out exactly as he said said it would, mm -hmm. and it's still absolutely blood curdling. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's another thing that, like, you know, when it comes to, I think Lynch has a really unique sense of pacing. Yeah, that a lot of directors couldn't really pull off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, you know, it's interesting to me that there are those who feel. I feel like people who don't like Mulholland Drive, mm. or people who don't think it's the 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 towering masterpiece that a lot of other people do. Um, I think. The sticking point for a lot of them seems to be when the film makes that turn that you're talking about. Mm. Because you can see the exact moment that Lynch, this stops being the pilot for a TV show and right. starts being Mulholland Drive, the, right. the movie. And I, th I think it's the sex scene, really. I think yeah. that is the moment where it's just like, this thing is now in Well, I mean, a, obviously you couldn't have that on ABC. Well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely couldn't. That would you not know? work on ABC. But just in terms yeah. of content, it's the moment where it's just and like- And in 2001, yeah. even if you know they left out the sex scene, two women- having a relationship would not have been allowed on That's probably ABC true, actually. Yeah, you, didn't, you really did not see that much in 2001. No, it w was yeah. not common to have a, a lesbian relationship on totally. TV then. So that's sort of the moment. And I feel like a lot of people who don't like Mulholland Drive think that it sort of loses the thread at the end. That's such a foreign thought to me because I think the ending is what makes Mulholland Drive. No, that's what makes it what it is. That's what makes it a horror movie. Yeah. That's what really underlines the, the true, like, black pit. Like, yeah. you know, that 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 Hollywood calls you in with all these sparkly dreams and then you fall into this bottomless pit. Yeah. The the, yeah. the very simple philosophical thrust of this thing is very powerful to me, which is that, you know, it, the movie gives us the melodramatic fantasy of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. It gives us this this dreamy soap opera look at Hollywood through through the eyes of this character, mm -hmm. Naomi Watts's character. And then it poisons that with despair in the way that in a way that probably a lot of people have really experienced. They yeah. have this idea of what Hollywood is going to be. They go out there and Hollywood destroys them. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a yeah. simple observation delivered in a very powerful, intuitive style with a really, you know, unique and I think masterful kind of grip on like uh, something that I remember from screenwriting classes, they always said you have to master the form before you can shatter it. Mm -hmm. And I think by this point, Lynch uh, w was at you know the point in his like storytelling ability that he could shatter it yeah. and have it still work. Like I said, if not on a logic level, on an intuitive level. Totally. Yep. And uh, I, I end up just sort of coming back to how just how many great individual scenes there are in this mm. film. You know, just how many moments that you could almost pluck out of the film and would just play like gangbusters, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, not just the Winky's Diner scene. I mean, the remarkable sex scene as well. The Club Silencio scene. Oh, you the know? Club Silencio scene. My yeah. God, it's so good. Yeah. <laughs> One of our coworkers, I won't say who, has a tattoo of the blue cube. <laughs> from all time. It's very cool. Um, I also love the uh, I love the scene where she goes on the audition, mm -hmm. you know, and just turns it on. Mm -hmm. You know, that's such a remarkable scene because mm -hmm. um, that's such a remarkable scene about the gross, lecherous realities of Hollywood. Yeah, and also about what actors have to do sometimes mm -hmm. to, to make it in this industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're, you're seeing that, but you're also seeing, you're like, oh, holy shit, this character who we had no idea if she could act or not, can. suddenly she can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she uses, she twists, she twists the lecherousness of that moment to her advantage. Yeah. Um, something I think is really interesting is we see her rehearsing that scene at home before the audition, and then we see her at the audition, and she plays it completely differently. Yeah. Yep. Yep, totally. Yeah, Watts is really remarkable in this movie. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can see why this this kind of made her a movie star. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. It's kind of sad that that Laura Herring didn't become a bigger star. Yeah, this too. yeah. Um, not yeah. You didn't see a whole lot of her. I mean, Justin yeah. Theroux, obviously. 
um, uh, he's had a career had for a certain. great yeah. career as well yeah. this was one of the first times I saw him I'm not sure how much of a career he had before this but speaking of another scene that you could pluck out that I think is really great is when that character drives up to the top of the Hollywood Hills and he walks into that um what would you even call it? Like a rodeo paddock? Yeah. And this light comes flickering on. There's some cool electricity mm-hmm. stuff in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and this light comes flickering on and this cowboy comes out and gives him like cryptic instructions. That seems so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's a remarkable film. And I feel comfortable being uh, with it being at the top of mm-hmm. our list, mm-hmm. even if um, it's not necessarily my favorite. Yeah. So I think a lot of people regard Mulholland Drive as kind of the pinnacle of Lynch's craft mm. and, and maybe even his concerns as an artist. Mm. Uh, he's obviously done things since. And, you know, he, he made one more feature. He made mm-hmm. Inland Empire, which I think is very much in the same, um, very different film than Mulholland Drive, but one that, that has a lot of the same concerns, I think. Well, since I'm sharing all my uh, spicy opinions today, I think that uh, Inland Empire is kind of an example of why someone like David Lynch needs a producer. They need <laughs> okay. someone to be like... Let's keep the let let's tighten up this narrative, bud. <laughs> ah, see, I really like Inland Empire. Really? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I'll admit I haven't watched it uh, really since I saw it in theaters mm-hmm. when it came out. So it's been a long time since I've seen it. But um, that is definitely it's a much messier film than Mahal and Drive. Were for sure. you at the music box when David Lynch was there? I was. Oh, I was like. The biggest day for me. I yeah. was so excited. <laughs> Very cool. In any case, so uh, if Mulholland Drive is sort of the pinnacle of, of, of Lynch's craft, mm-hmm. I think you could probably say that about my choice, too. Yeah. Um, even if some might might disagree. Um, uh, my pick is Wes Anderson's The Royal Tenenbaums. I think this is probably, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is probably Anderson's most beloved movie in the long term. It's interesting. I, I would say that that probably is true. Yeah. I, if you polled, you know, what was it, 177 people who called Mulholland Drive the, the the great movie of the 21st century. I think if you polled those same people, you would about Wes Anderson's career, they mm-hmm. would probably come out saying that Ten and Bombs is his is his high point. I certainly think it is. Yeah. Um, I think there have been some. There is a contingent out there who thinks that Anderson's uh, latter day work is more meaningful, or mm. at least that he's made some better films. I think Grand Budapest is the one that that people often reach for if they don't reach for Tenenbaums they, they reach for Grand Budapest um, and on the other end of the spectrum I think there, there are still the rider dies for Rushmore that's the yeah movie, you know yeah but you know <laughs> similar to looking at like a racer head versus Mulholland Drive there's just so prog- so much progression in between very much so yeah and uh, I look at Royal Tenenbaums and I see this as the beginning of Anderson as the beginning of the West An- Anderson we know today mm-hmm. uh, as exactly. this, this kind of creator of meticulous dioramas mm-hmm. you know these, these dollhouse worlds that he creates um, and he's made more elaborate films in the years since. I think if you look French at French Dispatch. Yeah, I mean, even this year, French Dispatch is. I, I think. I think you can almost make the case that in terms of the sheer, the sheer wealth of of detail and the sheer density mm-hmm. of design in French Dispatch. Exactly. It might be his most elaborate piece of work. Design in terms of art direction and in camera work. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I forget how many sets they, they built for French Dispatch. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. Like almost mm-hmm. every shot is a new set. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> w- one of the reasons that I think the French Dispatch is one of the great films of the year. But uh, I I look at Royal Tenenbaums and I think that it to me it strikes the perfect balance between that side of Anderson, the, the side of him mm-hmm. that is um, constantly building these elaborate worlds, these dollhouse worlds. Yeah, the, the side that um, people – bring up a lot when they're kind of making fun of it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which, which to me, I, I guess this is a fine place to talk about this. That uh, It's always struck me as a little absurd. I mean, like, it's not like we have a ton of people exactly like Wes Anderson who are doing this. Yeah. And there's not like the people who do try to do it like Wes Anderson don't have half his talent and half his, you know, he is he is so, I like that a, that a single shot of his movie creates an entire world. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, well, I personally think that that particular opinion is based more on parodies of Wes Anderson. <laughs> Wes yeah. Anderson, Can I say so. one thing that I really fucking hate is those YouTube, what if Wes Anderson directed this parodies? Mm-hmm. I think they're so superficial. They're so superficial about what his values are as a director. And none of them have a fraction of his talent for actually filling the frame and for for composition for for art design you know mm-hmm. like if you're going to if you're going to parody something do it well and to i think to be fair they don't have a fraction of his budget i imagine well, the Anderson true. movies have pretty healthy budgets <laughs> no he, he he definitely gets a, a fair amount of money to to do what he does yeah you have to to make such elaborate um, this is a total aside, but when I was a kid, I had this thing. It was like a, it was like a little um, diorama, which was like it was like a little stage. It was a piece of magnetized. 
it was like magnetized underneath. And there were all these different magnetized little figures you could move around with like a little magnetized stick mm-hmm. underneath the thing and all these different um, backdrops you could put up and stuff. And whenever I watch a Wes Anderson movie, I think about that toy <laughs> yeah. I had as a kid. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that there there is a real element of that in his <laughs> filmmaking, you know. Um, you're right, though, that, uh, that yeah, he, he, he clearly is dealing with a lot of money. Um, he usually has a lot of money to make these And that's things. okay because that means he can pull it off. <laughs> I mean, yeah, look what he uses that money. Yeah, on, totally. You know, you see it on the screen. Yeah, it's yeah. not one of those things where you're like, "This costs how much for what?" No, everything <laughs> is up there on the screen. You know, I will say, the, uh, I think about this sometimes when 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 watching the Royal Tenenbaums too. Is I don't think that soundtrack happens today. Mm. I think that um, royalty, the the uh, the business of music royalties has changed pretty dramatically in mm-hmm, twenty years, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I think if this movie gets made today, it, it like its budget is uh, is is doubled that based on all of, all the big songs that are in yeah, this movie. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, it is true that like nowadays, if you want to have like a, a kind of a jukebox soundtrack, you you need to have uh, a bit a big budget and probably some pull. Right, totally. You know, like Tarantino can get away with it. Right, exactly. But yeah, I mean, you the know, publishers are happy to work with someone like that. Yeah, or a Cruella, you know that. Yeah, <laughs> oh, well, <that's> Cruella. <laughs> but I mean, like Tenenbaums cost. Cruella's uh, should have been a little more focused in its <laughs> soundtrack choices, but that's just me. Yeah, a Tenenbaums cost uh, apparently cost twenty one million, which uh, is a lot of money for an indie. It is not a lot of money for what that a movie mini is. major at the time. That's like a typical budget for a mini major totally. of the era. The mid budget movie, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> they, they, R- they existed then. R I P. Yeah, um, but it's it's actually kind of remarkable to me to think that he made this movie for just twenty one million dollars right. because right. it really does create a whole world. I and mean, it's kind of a handcrafted world, which mm-hmm. is which is um, really nice. Yeah, for sure. I, I sort of like his. Uh, you know, over the years, Anderson has been dinged for, um, for a little bit of culture appropriation. I have complicated thoughts about mm. that, but I think that the reality is that one thing that Anderson does, has done his entire career, is offer the sort of Wes Anderson version of, of, of a time and place. Right. And I, I, I sort of have always loved just on the most basic level, his vision of this sort of out of time New York. Mm-hmm. Like this is a quintessential New York movie to me, in part because it, it, it's a version of New York that doesn't really exist. It's a version right. that exists in people's imaginations. Or didn't, or is like a pretty... Um, I mean, like, you know, yeah, it's like intellectual uh, mid-century New York a little bit. With, yeah. 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 I mean, it, it's it's interesting that he made um, that he made the French Dispatch this year. He finally mm-hmm. made a movie that is an extended tribute to the New Yorker because mm-hmm. the Tenen- the Royal Tenenbaums feels to me like a vision of New York that could exist within the pages of the New Yorker. Yeah, like a New Yorker cartoon. Totally, almost. a New Yorker yeah. cartoon. And uh, I mean, obviously there's a ton of influences on this film. I mean, Anderson is never shy about who he's who he's who he's citing when he makes a movie. This 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 movie is has a little bit of J.D. Salinger in it. Mm-hmm. It has Orson Welles as the Magnificent Ambersons in it. It has Harold uh, and Maude. Yeah, there's a little Harold and Maude. There's a little Edward Gorey in it as well. Yeah. Uh, and he just sort of corrals those into what feels like a singular vision. Mm-hmm. You know, you can see those influences, but you can still look at this film and go, "This is." This 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 is one hundred percent Wes Anderson. For me, uh, the most delightful part of Wes Anderson movies is his uh, approach to storytelling and how it's kind of it, it's more like a book, yeah. than like a he he approaches his screenplays like books with chapters, yeah. which is uh, one of the things I I enjoy about his filmmaking. Yeah, I mean, this one is structured very explicitly as as a sort of imaginary novel, mm-hmm. you know, with different chapters mm-hmm. and and I, I I I definitely have seen this enough times that I've I've um, I've paused it on. When we get those, when we get those chapter headings, and mm. just read the first page because yeah. it basically is just a description of what we end up seeing in that first shot. Oh, that's you know? cool. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think what I was saying before the, the, the reason that this this film I think is I think is Anderson's greatest film and, and the one that speaks to me the most is that it does strike that perfect balance between being this marvel of meticulous design where every sometimes every shot is giving you a new world mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, a balance between that and between finding a kind of soul soulful humanity in characters that are that sort of come across initially as as cartoon characters. Yeah, um, this is a very sad movie. This is a mm-hmm. melancholy movie. You, you know, um, this is a movie maybe by and for people with depression. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, just for those who haven't seen it, the basic plot of the film is it follows this family, the Tenenbaums, 
And uh, the the children of the family, the three children of the family, were all child prodigies. They all um, they all were very successful, very young. And then the film leaps into the present after this prologue, and we see what their lives have become. And they're all these kind of um, they're these kind of depressed geniuses, basically yeah. people who have not lived up to their potential. And which I think is just such a such a such a tender, affecting idea. Mm-hmm. At looking at these lives the that were the plight of the gifted child, for sure. The yeah. plight of the the gifted child, exactly. And we sort of follow this family, but we follow them mostly through the perspective of the, the patriarch of the family, Royal, uh, played by Gene Hackman. And um, I really wish this was Gene Hackman's final performance. Yeah. You know, he retired shortly thereafter. A few years later, he made two more movies after Tenenbaums. But um, this would have been a nice footnote. It's such a perfect, because it, it feels so much like a swan song for him in mm. some ways, even though I don't think he ever did anything quite like this earlier in his career. Mm-hmm. But in terms of this mischievous energy Hackman could have as an actor, um, for this to be his final role would have been so appropriate, you know? Yeah. Um, a lot of the casting is really great. Oh, like, yeah. I think Ben Stiller is very well cast. Yes. Can, can we talk about that? I yeah. Because mean, I feel like this was the first time that a lot of people, myself included, saw what a sensitive and affecting actor Stiller could be mm-hmm. outside of just pure comedies. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think you could look back and say 2001 might be the the signature year of Stiller's career because he also that same year did Zoolander as well. Right. It's like the two sides. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but I think what one of the things I love so much about Stiller in this movie is that he operates at such a – he basically is um, – you know, his character in Mystery Men is called Mr. Furious. That's kind of the energy he has in this. Mm-hmm. He's just, he's, you know, forever angry at his father for being the, the shithead father that he was right. and abandoning the family, essentially. And then, but there is this moment towards the end of this movie that makes me cry every single time yeah. I watch this movie. And it's that long take where we pan across. It's it's it's, uh, it's sort of the, the sequence after the dog is run over, basically. Mm. And we get that long take. We're following the different characters. And uh, Hackman's character, Royal, finds his son, Stiller. And Stiller just says, it's been a rough year, Dad. And oh, it, it's, yeah. That moment oh, crushes my heart every time I watch it. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, I'll say that this is a movie that will definitely, if you have any father issues whatsoever, I feel like this movie <laughs> will, will bring them out. Um, well, what's your take on the other, like, cool girl icon of 2001, which is Margot Tenenbaum? Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I got to say, from the years about 2002 to 2006, there was not a single Halloween party I went to that did not have a Margot Tenenbaum at it. <laughs> Every Style single icon, time. You know? <laughs> truly. <laughs> I do think it's one of her best performances mm-hmm. for sure. Um, maybe her best, honestly. Yeah. Um, even though it is in this kind of deadpan register, and I feel like most filmmakers have not seen that or used that from Peltrow since, yeah, or before or since, really. You yeah. Know? yeah, I mean, to be in an Anderson movie, you have to. There's this. There's a certain. There, that's kind of part of the job description is you have to be able to do deadpan. Yeah. But she does it just so gracefully. Just completely, in this film. completely deadpan. Yeah. yeah. But you also, you know, she's deadpan, but you get that sadness from her. She's one of the most depressive characters in the movie. She is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean almost, almost all the, the main characters in this film are um, characters who are struggling very, very deeply with depression and with, mm-hmm. and with, and with this, o- this overburdening sadness, you know, mm-hmm. which is why when people talk about Anderson as this overly precious film, filmmaker i'm like are you watching the movies yeah i like, think that it, it misses this this yeah that that um that melancholy you could call it bit would you say bittersweet or just straight melancholy because i think it's more just melancholy i think it's melancholy i think this yeah. is a, this is a and and i think it's one of the things that really speaks to me about the movie is how melancholy it really is mm-hmm. i mean it's i do think this is like his funniest movie too and i laugh like through the entire film mm-hmm. But there is a there is a deep deep sadness for these characters and for their lives in this film too. Uh, it, it, this movie has also become kind of a Christmas perennial for me. Oh, interesting! Uh, you know, I, I watched it one year. Uh, I was tra- I was trapped in a hotel room on Christmas because a flight got canceled, and I watched it in the hotel room. What a and- bummer! <laughs> Yeah, it was a bummer. <laughs> but this was on TV. And, uh-huh. um, you know, I mean, Christmas isn't really an element in it other than using the – there is a moment where Anderson uses the Charlie Brown uh, oh, Christmas. Christmas theme. Which, you know, as soon as you brought this up as a Christmas movie, I was like, yeah, this is very much in like a Charlie Brown Christmas kind of register. <laughs> and those are, those are the Christmas movies that speak to me the most are the mm. ones that recognize that there's a certain sadness about that time of the year, too. Oh, yeah. That that, um, that, that the the way that, that the Christmas season is constantly, um, we're constantly expected to feel happy, how that can enhance your feelings of unhappiness mm-hmm. and your feelings of melancholy. And there's just something. And loneliness, too, because loneliness, like yeah. if everyone else around you 
you seem to ha- happy and you're not. It's like, oh, what's wrong with me? Exactly, yeah. And I, I think this movie taps into that really well. It's also, I think, a, a beautiful film about family, and um, th- which is, you know, what Christmas is about on some level, <laughs> for a lot of people anyway. You know, mm. it's just about being with the family. And uh, I've always thought that this movie's attitude about the Hackman character is really inspired. I think that he is, the movie acknowledges what a scoundrel he is. Mm -hmm. You know, it never tries to make him seem like he's not kind of a bastard. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately the the kids deciding to forgive him and the family deciding to forgive them, I think what Anderson is saying is that's a choice that you make as an adult that's more maybe about you than it is about them. Right. You say, I'm going to let this go or I'm going to put this behind me and... I think you see that the most in Ben Stiller's character. For sure. Mm-hmm. Him deciding in the end that he you know, he knows that his father is is a deeply flawed man and, and an asshole and that he, he, he was in many ways a failure to and them. There's nothing he can do about but it. But he can't change that. All yep. he can do is try to make something meaningful about the years he has left with him. Mm-hmm. I'm getting choked up even talking about it. It's, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a beautiful idea, and I think I think the movie, I, I think one of the tight ropes that this movie walks is being like maybe it's a good thing to forgive your parents at some point, but also acknowledge that they are sons of bitches. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, I mean that's a lot of like having adult relationships with your parents. For you sure. know, is acknowledging that they're human beings and they're not you know omnipotent and. Yep. Yeah, there are days when I think that this might be my favorite movie, honestly. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, you know, it's not always, but I will say that it's one that I watch uh, roughly once a year at this point, and I'm always, I, I know it pretty much back to start at this point, but it always makes me laugh. I think it's, um, and I and I think it's a much deeper film than, than, than Anderson's critics would make it out to be, even if it is the movie that when we talk about these dumb parodies that people make of Wes Anderson, they're really, what I mean, what are they really parodying? They're parodying the Royal Tenenbaums, right? Yeah, pretty much. Or maybe like Life Aquatic. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I don't know if I would say Mulholland Drive is my favorite movie, but David Lynch, you know, for a long time is my favorite film director. I did a whole studied him at length in, in college and I really like his style really resonates with me. Mm-hmm. I think it's really cool. You know, like I believe I said on a more recent episode, I don't need a movie to make sense as long as the vibes are right. And right. the vibes are always perfect. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sinister, <laughs> but Lynch is a vibes filmmaker. Yes, and so is. it appeals yeah. to me very much. Yep. And um, yeah, I mean, I obviously think he's one of the greats. So. Yep. That's all we've got for you this week. You can see our list of the best films of 2001 on avclub.com. And if you'd like to watch the films, Mulholland Drive is currently streaming on Criterion Channel and The Royal Tenenbaums is streaming on Prime Video. While you're at it, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to Film Club wherever you get your podcasts. This week's episode of Film Club was hosted by me, Alex Dowd, and by Katie Reif. It was produced, edited, and mixed by Carl Blomberg, and our motion graphics designer is Julie Mullins. Check back next week. We'll have our final episode of Film Club in 2021, talking about the best movies of the year. Thanks, folks. Bye.